Thank you, Julian. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, a privilege to be in front of all of you. Um, you can see a title there, you can see my name, you can see the two organizations that I'm affiliated with, and I would like, obviously, to thank both the, the sponsors uh, for this conference. So that's one uh, organization I'm affiliated with, and obviously we just want to take our minds back into this sort of era. Um, Sherrod, you can see one of your longhorn buffalo just beyond the, the wetland there. I'll have a little photograph of something of that later. But that's where we want to get ourselves back to. But just very briefly first, what am I doing here? I'm all the way from Canada. So I'm actually in a little place in northern British Columbia with a population of 2,500 people. Very remote. And in 2000, uh, two kids aged 8 and 11 discovered this Cretaceous dinosaur trackway right close to town. The eight-year-old was my son, and that's, that's how I got into it. That's why I'm retired from medicine, simply retired. So we got a lot of support from local industry. This was in minus 32 degrees. We brought this Tyrannosaur track into town. And uh, who was mentioning crocodile? I think it was, you were mentioning the crocodilian traces. So we got beautiful swim traces. So we were finding things like this everywhere that allowed us to create this dinosaur discovery gallery museum and offer lantern tours by night to these trackways and daytime tours to these third-party trackways. And as a result of this, I will tell you that South Africa, for all the funding challenges, etc., are the streets ahead of Canada in terms of heritage appreciation. I wish we had a Heritage Day in British Columbia because it's been a real uphill battle to get anything recognized. But Vancouver and Victoria are way down there in the bottom on the left. And thanks to the work that we've done, essentially as volunteers employing a few scientists, our little town of 2,500 people has become the center of excellence in vertebrate paleontology in British Columbia. <laughs> that is, to give you an idea of the size of a Tyrannosaur track, that's uh, Liam reclining in one. And so we do have the only known Tyrannosaur trackways in the world with these three parallel trackways, seven tracks. So it's lovely thing to be involved in. Also got these large-scale dinosaur track sites with a few hundred or few thousand tracks and there we are making a latex peel on one of the rock walls there. Another site has got an estimated 10,000 tracks. So there's a lot of cool stuff there and as a result of all of this we became a UNESCO Global Geopark. Similar to a World Heritage Site, not quite the same but for all intents and purposes it's similar. So that got me into ethnology, and then I kept on coming back to South Africa where I'm originally from, the Southern Cape, and many of you might know Dave Roberts, uh, discovered that Dave was doing all this work on tracks along the Southern Cape, and then he tragically passed away in 2015. Uh, but he was a mentor, a much appreciated mentor of the work that I'm doing. So I've chosen 275 kilometers of the Cape South Coast. We've gone from Bitsant in the west to Roburg in the east, and we've got over 100 Pleistocene track sites there. Lovely, just like walking along the beach looking for tracks. It's very cool. The Cape Lion, that's the photogrammetry of the Cape Lion. We've identified 16 avian track sites. Um, this is very, very distinctive giraffe, the first uh, giraffe tracks probably from Africa. Um, essentially, the no records before this from south of the Orange River, so giraffe need trees, so lots of paleo environmental implications, and once you get your eye in, elephant tracks are everywhere. And this is a Hokama special, that beautiful, beautiful trackway there, and this is what I wanted to show to Sherrod, because this is our photogrammetry, and this is a bit distorted here, because these uh, images here are a bit lengthened this way. But um, this we have interpreted as the, the first known trackway in the world of Pelerobus antiquus, the long -horned, extinct long-horned buffalo, which Sherrod mentioned earlier. But possibly the thing that's been the most exciting was this cave. Um, it's a beautiful site, and on the ceiling are these tracks, which you'll have no difficulty identifying. Um, you've got to go deep into the cave, and it's kind of in your face, very, not very deep, and you, this is what you get. So very clearly hominin tracks. It's the third hominin track site in southern Africa. And here we are doing the photogrammetry work. It took about 2,500 photographs to enable the photogrammetry, which has yielded images like this. So I discovered this, all this technology in southern Africa, which is very cool. 
But you can't do ethnology in Southern Africa without being pulled like a magnet to Lesotho. This is the kind of where it all happens, where Roger, a lot of your work has taken place, and it's because this is where the wonderful dinosaur tracks occur. And you get to Lesotho, and then you discover there's this other thing called geomythology. So that's how, I hope it wasn't too long of an introduction, but it tells you how I got into geomythology. And we're talking about the first geologists and paleontologists in the world. And so this is a paper which we've submitted to Proceedings of the Geologists Association. This year it's currently under review. And there's the title, which is, you can see the list of authors there. You'll recognize some of the names. You'll recognize Julian. You'll recognize Cameron. Many of you might know Haley and Renee, well-known names in Southern Africa. The name that you might not know is Adrian Mayer. And I've underlined here there for a reason. Um, and you recognize that's the Simon Spark, I think, in the background there. So this is when she was visiting South Africa a few years ago. She's the global pioneer in geomythology. She has led the way. So what is geomythology? Um, there's a definition at the top there um, from 1973 that kind of introduced the idea. But more broadly, it's just to investigate and document how pre-scientific cultures interpreted geological and fossil data, which is very much, Julian, what you made this conference out to be. And there's just one definition we've got to get here. Um, called a manuport, not everyone might know the meaning of that. So these are unmodified objects collected, transported, deposited by hominins in occupation deposits in which they could not possibly occur naturally. And Bed Marek has done a lot of work on this, and his says they have outstanding visual or material properties that are presumed to have prompted their acquisition. So that's a manuport. So just some of the work of Adrian Mayer, because geomythology is very well established in North America, Europe, um, all of Asia, not in Africa. This is the point. This is why this conference is so important. But this is some of the work that Adrian Mayer has done elsewhere in the world. So the legend of the dragon. Well, there's all this physical evidence in China. Scales, lipidodendron, tree bark, etc. Um, fossilized dinosaur skin, all these things that, and, and the fact that extinct deer and giraffe have got antlers very much like what gets depicted on, on dragons. And of course, in China, you've got dinosaur tracks everywhere, these big three-toed tracks. So, you know, she's essentially explained where dragons come from, where the, the legend of dragons comes from. And this is even more interesting, perhaps, the griffin. Many of you would have heard this mythical creature called the legendary griffin, the body of a lion, the beak of an eagle, this creature. And essentially, Adrian has just about, beyond a shadow of doubt, proven that these are, I think that prosauropods, Think, but I'm not quite sure. But these things were often buried by sandstorms in the Gobi Desert, standing. And they're fossils standing up, and then eventually everything gets taken away. And you know, the, the inhabitants of the Gobi Desert would come across these huge dinosaurs. With the, you can see the top center there. You can see it looks like an eagle's beak, and it's got the four-footed quadruped body of a lion. So this is almost without doubt where the Griffin legend comes from. So Adrian has proved this kind of thing, and these are foundational things in the history of, of geomythology. So for us to have Adrian on this paper is just really fantastic. And But here's the background. Adrian Mayer, 2004, summarized geomythology across the world, nothing about Southern Africa. In 2011, she noted that further studies from Africa are, quote, eagerly awaited. So why is there this shortage from Africa and more specifically from Southern Africa. There are three possibilities, and we'll come back to this later. But number one, people here just didn't care. There was no indigenous geomythology. It's possible. Okay. Number two, it, it existed, but it left minimal traces. So it was there, but there's nothing we can find to decipher it. Number three, there's been insufficient interest in Southern Africa in exploring this discipline. Those are the three options, right? So this thing. We started off with our paper looking at sites across um, Africa. We're going to come down to southern Africa, but we're going to start with the rest of Africa. And this is probably the oldest manuport um, of Homo sapiens. Um, it's 300,000 years, Morocco, 1984. So many people see a resemblance, and it's a phallic resemblance here, and one can speculate as to why this, it's a cephalopod fossil, and it was carried a certain distance to a shelter. So. That's the top one there, Morocco. But we also found examples in the literature in our review from Algeria, where there's the rock 
the big Niger, Niger, solar part dinosaur bands, a case in Uganda, an interesting case from Cameroon, uh, a sligger on Molar, a uh, menu port from the Congo, Tanzania, the Tendagur, the famous site, local people drew the attention of the Germans to these beds of dinosaur bones. They knew all about them. Then they were made to carry the bones for the Germans. That was a separate story. But then what's also really cool to me, 1725, African slaves from Angola go over to North America, and they tell the North Americans, these are elephant teeth that we were uncovering here. These are mammoth teeth. So this is the first vertebrate fossil, fossil identification in North America, and it's African slaves that were responsible for it. So something, maybe we can be proud of that. So this is, many of you I'm sure have been to Karoo National Park. Um, this is the fossil trail, and it says their fossil bones, teeth, and spoil must have been familiar to indigenous inhabitants for thousands of years. Sadly, we've got no record of what these acutely observant people thought about them. So that's option two. There was the tradition, but we can't identify it. So that's... Then again, you start thinking to yourself, the sand were these enormously gifted trackers. Maybe the, the best trackers the world has ever seen. How could they see things like this in the rocks? and not recognize them and think something about them. So essentially, our team has now come across, with our review, we've come across 21 sites, and we've discovered a new one. So we've got 22 sites in Southern Africa. And you can see here, it's reasonably you know, geographically distributed. There's a cluster around the Sutu, Drakensberg, cluster in the Cedarberg, which will, I'm sure, make one of us very happy here. And, um, but what we have to do is go back to the foundation. And this is what got me into this in the beginning. Mokali Cave is near the river in, in Lesotho. And this is the, the foundation, I think, for Southern African geomythology. So to understand this, there's the Edin Bajay dynasty, a missionary dynasty, three generations. And the second generation did a lot of rock art work with his son, Paul, Paul Edin Bajay. So in 1930, when Paul was 12 years old, he visited Mokali Cave with his dad. And they found um, what seemed to be a dinosaur footprint in the middle, surrounded by three other images, which looked like the track makers. Buttressing this, there's a dinosaur skeleton right outside the cave, and immediately below in the valley, there are dinosaur tracks. This is one of them, right out no, in the valley below the cave. That's when he was 12. 75 years later, he was now 87, and he published in Ignos, along with a bunch of other august authors. And I don't know if I have to, you can just read it, uh, rather than me, but they, um, they had these riveting, very bold conclusions. They said these folks, and they said it was the sand, uh, were far more adept at identifying the track makers than Richard Owen and these famous names from Britain in the 19th century. So these guys had it way better than Owen. Owen didn't know what he was doing by comparison. So these are the images. You can see they're very, very bird-like which is very different from what Richard Owen uh, developed in the beginning. And that is what remains of the footprint, very faded. And so I went there with Kevin Krauss, some of you might know him, and we were able to convert it into this thanks to Kevin's technology. And then Ellen Bajet and company drew on Leuk and Lloyd's ethnographic studies, and they had, again, these incredible um, conclusions. Um, the, you know, these footprints would have left vivid impressions of you know, giant footprints left by wandering dinosaurs. They knew instinctively that the tracks were real and must have represented once living animals. And then there's this, this um, tradition of Kwai Hem, or Kolumolumo, as it's known to the, uh, the Sutu, this monster that devoured communities and people, that held primacy over all the creatures which were then living on Earth during the far old beginning. So these amazing, almost emotional um, conclusions. So there you see the, the footprint again. Again, it's stretched this way, so it's not quite that wide. But an interesting thing, if you think of any dinosaur footprint that you've ever seen in a book or in a work of art, it's always pointing up, always. And what, this one is pointing down. There's only one other image of a dinosaur track in the world for prehistoric art that I'm aware of, and it's this one from Black Point, Arizona. It's pointing down. So why do the only two prehistoric artworks both point down? Something just to think about. So this sort of approximates the original um, geomythology um, definition. And Emesha Bordi, many of you might know, Emesha's from UCT, she tells me that when they go into the Sutu, they just, you know, the locals talk about the tracks as the tracks of Kolumolumo. 
and she just tells them, oh, we're tracking Kolomoloma, now leave her alone, and now she's up to. So it's, it's kind of interesting. The problem is, um, the conclusions of Ellen Berger are, were bold and they were riveting. I think they are over-interpreted, and I don't think they're correct. It's actually very unlikely, I think, that the sand were responsible for that art. It's more likely the late white group of paintings. So there are significant challenges there with this article, but still, it's still the foundation stone. So I'm not just going to go through a bunch of other examples from Southern Africa, just to try and inspire you with some of the work that we've um, researched and uh, reviewed. So the Makapan Scott Cobble, um, I've just met Bernard today, this is thanks, good to see you Bernard. Uh, so if you look at that, you'll, I'm sure most of you know about this anyway, but it looks like two eyes and a sort of a funny little nose and a mouth and maybe a hairline, etc. And this was excavated in 1925, Jasper out, uh, Jasper found in a cave dated to almost three million years, looks like a face, so the inference is that an australopithecine appreciated the likeness to a face and the color, transported it to the cave, a menu port, oldest example in the world of self-awareness, and it carries several kilometers. So, um, Kevin, you, someone said, you know, we've got so much to be proud of. But here's another case where Southern Africa has the, the oldest in the world. And then the Greek Mesosaurus. Now, the Greek we know um, is not specifically pre-Western, because Greek word is a, quite a, a diverse group. But this was collected by an ex a French explorer, Vero, in 1830-31, near the junction of the Orange and Far Rivers. And he found the specimen in the hut of a Greek word, on a shell slab, being used as a pot lid. So the, this Greek word person had picked this up, brought it to his hut. No one knows who this person was. But this became the holotype for Mesosaurus to New Orleans, which was huge, um, according to Julian, in continental drift uh, theory. And this might well have been the first known discovery of the vertebrate body fossil in southern Africa. Um, there you can see it. It's a very impressive um, specimen, and it's currently, I believe, in Paris, Julian. I'm not sure. I think it's, it's somewhere in Europe, anyway. Yeah. So we have other examples. Busman copy is within Mokala National Park. And this is an engraving, where you've got a tridactyl big engraving. Um, and it, this is now speculation, but that's what it looks like. So could this be a depiction, an engraving of a huge uh, three-footed creature that someone had seen somewhere else and reproduced here? You've got the example of scarf lots near Clarence. It's a beautiful, richly decorated shelter, very famous. But on the, the, the back wall, say, you know, sort of half the size of this room, that you've got three clusters of rock art, quite a few meters apart. And each of these clusters, there's a dinosaur footprint in front of it, on, on, the, on the ceiling, on the floor. So could it be coincidence? Yes. But could it be significant? Could be. So here you can see the arrows point to um, the Sutosaurus trackway. And up at the top, sort of towards the top left, you can see the Eland artwork. So the artist would have had a crouch on the dinosaur tracks to do the painting. There you can see the arrow pointing to a massive spondylus footprints in the ceiling. And there you can see the artwork, which is called the Enigma, because no one knows what it is. But I, mean, I can sort of see dinosaur images there, um, if you want to. You can see anything you want to, of course. But um, it's, you, know, you can see a gaping jaw there, etc. So why are the, the, the art images associated with the footprints? And there's a site in Poland which tells us about this. Um, very similar, a dinosaur track beside a petroglyph. And there they suggested that the petroglyphs accentuated the mysterious, perhaps supernatural character of the footprint. And that the presence of the footprints might have inspired Shams to choose that site, etc. So we do have examples from elsewhere in the world which are very similar. Our zone near Foresburg, here you've got a rock slab on the floor of a cave, and you've got dinosaur bones very close to it, on the slab and on the ceiling. And the paintings are on the nearest available flat surface. So there you can see the dark arrow points to it. It's enlarged there on the right. And just above my head there, you can see the painting. So the spatial association, is it significant? We can't prove it, but you've got to think, could it be? There's a similar site in the Drakensberg, um, where you've got abandoned rock art and a massive spondylus skeleton very close to it. That's the, that's the skeleton. Yeah. Then we got these two 
um, sites, one in Lesotho, one in Mountain Goodwood, where we've got dinosaur bones in caves that don't occur naturally in the caves. And, uh, you know, Flog said about the one at Balakla, um, where there's just a terminal phalanx, a toe bone of a massive spondylus. The object must have had sufficient curiosity value for someone to take it home. That is not the specimen, that is from Robert Grunewald's collection, but that's what a massive spondylus phalanx looks like. And you can see why somebody might have picked it up and thought, that's cool, I'm going to take it home. This is from the Cedarburg. And, you know, what do those images look like? Um, they don't look like any extant creatures. So, the interesting thing here, um, the regional trackways are not of dinosaurs, the regional trackways are of Permian tetrapods. And now Martin Lockley is probably the global leader in ecology. And he's got this slightly non-mainstream theory, but he's, his position is in the study of tracks, whether a track is narrow or wide, um, it's all connected with the hand and the body, and these relationships go throughout. So if you see what the tracks look like, if you're a really good tracker, you know what the whole animal looks like. So can trackways provide information on the whole animal? And so those paintings, um, Martin has gone through this, uh, these images with me, and he said, yep, if you had a trackway of Bradosaurus or one of these mammal-like reptiles, and you were a great tracker, you would draw something like that. So it's speculation, but it is worth thinking about. Then there's the fascinating thing of fulgurites. As you know, these are tubes of glass that are formed when uh, sand gets struck by lightning under trees. And so the sand in Botswana referred to these, and this is from research by Marshall in the 1950s, rain teeth or lightning teeth. And the fulgurite was then splintered, added to plant material, and placed in a rain horn, either to call rain or lightning, or to protect people from lightning. So here's real geomythology and an excellent understanding. Think of the Kalahari, but no rocks at all, except for these. That's the only rock you've got. Um, Cameron already mentioned this one. This is the famous tridobite um, in the northern Cedarburg. Um, so the nearest outcrops are 10 k's distant, and Miller and Company said the same thing, it's a manuport, evidence that these fossils attracted the attention of indigenous people in pre-colonial times. This is the Clipfontaine Run site, which is in the eastern Cedarburg. I want you just to look into the depths of that excavation there, that little ellipse, that's what we are looking at. And uh, it's a trilobite in Middle Stone Age deposits. Uh, it's a complete Burmisteria. Uh, species, and this had to be carried at least 400 meters. Not that long, but still, still had to be carried. And there we see how deep it is in those um, sediments, and there it's coming out, and there, that's what it looks like. Mackay was the researcher that did this. And then there's the amazing um, phenomenon of quartz. And this particular example is from Durban, where Lewis and Williams and, and, and Pierce described this uh, four centimeter long point. And they said it's way too fragile to use, you know, for spear or arrow or anything. And it had to have some spiritual meaning. And that's the, 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 the quartz point that was carved at, at Durban. And quartz is amazing. Lewis, Williams, and Pierce say there's even this idea of possible altered states of consciousness that came from quartz. And that the way quartz glistens is like our eyes glistening. So there's an association between quartz and our eyes. And if you're in a cave and it's dark and you rub quartz together, it flashes and it makes these weird sparks, etc. So it's, you can imagine how cool this would have been for prehistoric inhabitants. They can produce electric voltage and therefore there's this spiritual power thing to quartz. And so we've got loads of sites of, uh, where quartz crystals have been carried into rock shelters and caves. And there's one site which we've got where there are figures and there are big patches and then the, the art has used the veins of quartz to enhance the artwork. So very much awareness of, of, of quartz. And then this just, this is a rock engraving, um, thanks to John Armand again, from Maribobol in the Karoo. There's that Bermisteria trilobite at the bottom right. Now, if we start looking at rock art through the lens of a paleontologist or an ethnologist, could that image there possibly be a complicated trilobite? Could it be? But I think. So here are the questions. Could that sort of spiral have its origin in a trilobite? You think of how much in rock art has got these parallel lines. Could that be as elsewhere in the world, parallel lines often mean trilobites, North America, 
beautiful trilobite art. I asked Roger this question earlier today. You know, these sinuous, you sometimes get these, this sort of pattern in the rock art. Could that be any related to stromatolites or to amdigma, which are the fish traces? Could it be? Could nested shapes of U shapes, which we often see as well in the rock art, could that be Plagiopus that Gerard was speaking to us about? And then finally, we've got three sites on the Cape South Coast. The first one is the Oakhurst Shelter, which is close to Wilderness, and extensive excavations there in the 30s. Large number of human burials. That's what it looks like today. And I'm not showing you images of this for a, a reason, um, but there were these twin, probably twin, same size, same age, everything, infants sort of embracing each other. And they were about four years old. And in the orbit of the one is this huge quartz crystal that just fits inside this infant's orbit. Lewis Williams and Pierce again, and Hampson, this association between quartz and eyes. And Lewis Williams and Pierce said, there's this obvious tragedy of simultaneous deaths of two young kids. And maybe this quartz thing was just like a special precaution in the wake of such a tragedy. And I personally, um, I've looked at the photographs of this, they're, they're riveting photographs, but I, I have a personal feeling that this is disrespectful of um, you know, people that conducted such rituals to actually share these images. And that's just a personal preference, that's why there's no image of that. And this is the view from Blombos Cave, where everyone knows this, there are these in red, red ochres from the Middle Stone Age. Cross hatching, etc. Um, this is probably the best known of all the sites that I'm, I'm showing you, and that's the, the famous thanks to Chris Henschlerwood for providing us with that image. And then finally, we've got a new site, um, another geomythology site at Robert, which many of you might be aware of, called Cave 17. It was first described in the 1940s, I think, and that's what it looks like. And uh, Cameron helped us with identifying this because this is over 18 kilometers this thing was carried trilobite. So it's not a chance this thing occurs naturally on rubber. It came from probably 18 kilometers at least away. Beautiful trilobite specimen. So in wrapping up, if we go back to our three options, was the minimal Southern African non-Western indigenous geomythology? No, I think I've shown you that we have enough. Um, it, it, left, it, it, it existed but it left no traces? No, I've just shown you. We've got lots of traces if we keep our eyes open. So obviously number three, it's simply that we haven't been looking in exploring this discipline. So the answer is A, yes, and B, we're working on it. And what I'm hoping is that speaking to an august group like yourselves, many of you might have examples that you can bring to us because I'm convinced that as more people become aware of this, they're going to give us more sites, and we're going to learn a lot more. Maybe with the mythology, we, we can work on that. So bringing it all together, if we, as I've said, if we see indigenous rock art through the lens of the paleontologist, maybe this can benefit rock art research. Many reports are compelling. There's no doubt. That was picked up for a reason, carried to a cave. Fonda rights are compelling. When we get to the pictographs and the petroglyphs, Mokali Cave with the dinosaur track in the image, that's compelling. But other things, you know, we don't know for sure, but we think, could this be? So it's speculative. And then the rock art sites and the fossil sites, that, is that a coincidence? Is it an association? Is it causation? We don't know. We speculate. But it's falsifiable. One can do, and I'm hoping one of the students maybe will one day take this on, a database of all the rock art sites, a database of the fossil sites and the dinosaur bone sites. Is there a correlation? Was it just totally random? If there's a correlation, that would help prove it. So it's falsifiable. Okay. Finally, um, how to conclude. Non-Western cultures have natural knowledge of paleontology and geology. I hope I've given you enough evidence for that. They incorporated this into their legends, their art, and their understanding of the world. The other thing is we so easily get into our compartments, but geomythology is an interface between all these disciplines, archaeology, ethnology, paleontology, geology, anthropology, eth ethnography. So we really need to bring all these disciplines together to really do justice to this in Southern Africa. And I think also what we've got here, this is a uniquely African, uniquely Southern African contribution to international geomythology. Importantly, it's very well suited to education and interpretation. Um, I, I was touched by um, 
the words this morning about how to make paleontology more relevant to um, South Africans in general. Something like this can help instill pride. Um, and finally, this is just the beginning. As I, say, I hope we get more sites as a result of today's uh, talks. Further work is needed. So this was, I know we're going to be getting into our student talks in a, in a second. This was one of our conclusions as a group, which was simply that in countries that are reforging their cultural identity after a colonial past, yesterday's curious collectors may become an inspiration for a new generation of Southern African paleo scientists. So that's our, I think, our parting message. Um, references, if you need them, just please contact me. And thank you. Once again, thanks to the organizers and to the sponsors. It's totally a privilege to have been with you today. Thank you.